We're going to go ahead and get started uh, so that hopefully we can be kind to our children's Sunday school teachers uh, and get there to pick up our children at a reasonable time. I do have an announcement to make. Some of the rooms uh, around the construction area, those have moved this morning. Apparently after some of you dropped your children off, they moved. So if they are not there, Gwen, I know there's one class in the youth room, just everything towards the youth room. So just keep going this way. If your kids are not in the room you normally dropped them off in, keep going that way. All right? Don't give up. Don't give up. Yes. All right. I am Wright Bushing. I'm the youth director here at Redeemer. I've been here uh, in this capacity for just over a year now, although my wife Elizabeth and I have been here now for, for right at 10 years. Uh, we've been doing this about a year. You can see that our, our topic this morning is how do we practically maintain Jesus' heart to be a church that exists for maturing, growing the saints, and missions, reaching the lost. Now, I got a text from Elbert this week. He's on vacation, but he thought since Kawhi Leonard got traded and since LeBron James went to the Lakers, maybe we should just talk about that this morning. <laughs> but I figured we'll just, we'll just stick with this topic. And, and, and one of the reasons that Elbert asked me to do that this morning is because this particularly is important in our, our youth ministries and in our children's ministries. And I'm going to start off by showing you just several charts, just so you have an idea of what our children and youth ministries actually look like on Wednesday and Sunday nights. Now, I have to start just with a little disclaimer before we get into that. You're going to see terms up here like members or regular attenders. I'll use the term covenant kids interchangeably with that. You'll also see terms like visitors, uh, and you may hear kids from our community. I need to make sure that we understand that those terms are not racialized. Um, and I need to make sure that I say that because I've, I've gotten some feedback before that people think that those terms are racialized, that one group means a certain race and the other group means another race. And that's not the case. We have diversity within all of these different groups that we're about to talk about. But first, I want to talk about upside down. Upside down is our K-4 through 5th grade ministry that happens on Wednesday nights. You can see right there we've got members and regular attenders. Regular attenders, we would assume, are people that come on Sunday mornings, that their children are engaged in Sunday school regularly, and so they, they are dif different than just a regular visitor who does not involve themselves in anything else at the church. They make up 42%, 89 different children. That's just for the spring. Okay, so the spring 2018, 89 different children, 42%. Visitors would be those who come from outside of our covenant community, 122, 58%, 211 total kids. But this group on Wednesday nights, we can actually break down a little bit further because we have another group in there, and that is visitors who attend the Redeemer School. Because those visitors who attend the Redeemer School have a really close connection to our church that is different from somebody who just walks in once or twice. They're here every day throughout the year. And so that gives you a little bit clearer view of actually what, what a Wednesday night looks like. Okay, So 42% members, regular attenders, visitors who attend TRS, 20%, and then visitors overall, 38%. Okay, So you can see right off the bat, just from our children's ministry, that that idea of how do we love those in the covenant community and those outside the covenant community is important. Now I'll take you to Crossroads. That is our ministry on Wednesday nights to 6th through 8th grade students. Um, members, regular attenders right there make up 34%, a little bit less. The visitors make up 66%. Now some of that is due to uh, just the age of our church and the age of kids that we have at our church. I mean, you see 42 kids right there. Uh, that are visitors coming in. Zach just moved up a group of K-4 students into Sunday schools that my daughter is included in that has 42 kids. And that is just covenant kids in one grade. That's for three grades right there. Uh, so the life of our church changes right there. I'll also make one little statement about this group. Typically, if you walked in to the youth room on a Wednesday night, the breakdown would be much closer to 50% those that are covenant kids, members, regular attenders, and 50% visitors. And one of the reasons is we had a large number of visitors this spring 
who just came maybe once or twice. On, on an average basis, it really is much more of a pretty even split on a Wednesday night for Crossroads. The last group we'll talk about is Rooted. That is our 9th through 12th grade ministry. Uh, that is on Sunday night, so a different night. Um, again, a smaller group. That's 41 total kids for four grades of both Covenant kids, members, and those from outside the Covenant community. And I just told you we've got a group of four-year-olds that has 42 kids. And that's four, four grades right there. So you can see the ages of our church are changing. All right, But you see that's a little bit higher group, uh, those from within the Covenant community and those who are outside the Covenant community. If we put these all together, though, Children and Youth Ministry at Redeemer, that's kind of the split. That's the breakdown right there. 44% from within the covenant community, 56% from outside the covenant community. And so we have to understand that, that whether we agree or disagree with Jesus' heart being for those within the covenant community and those outside the covenant community, it matters to us simply based on what our children and youth ministries look like. That's what they are. And so that question is important to us. And the practicality of how we actually work that out is important. And now we need to address the title, but we're not going to get quite to the practical part yet. We're going to get to the part of, is, is this actually Jesus' heart? And where do we get that from? Last week, Pastor L read that verse, Acts 2, 38 and 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So it's pretty, pretty clearly stated right there, right? The promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off. But I want to start out working through a little bit different passage today. And, and it might be a passage that you don't necessarily associate with both those within the covenant community, and those outside the covenant community. I want to talk about this passage in Matthew 28, where, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. And to set up that passage, to remember where this is coming from, Mary Magdalene and Mary have gone to the tomb, seemingly to care for Jesus' dead body, and they get there, and there's an angel there. The angel tells them what? He's not here. He's alive. So they're overjoyed, but also a little scared. They're running to go tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. And Jesus meets them along the way. Again, they're overjoyed. They worship him. But they're also a little bit scared. He tells them not to be afraid, reminds them, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. And that's where we are right here in Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So they see Jesus. So they worship him, but look again in verse 17, but some still doubt. They're staring the risen Jesus face to face, but some still doubt. And then Matthew records Jesus giving what we know is the Great Commission. And as Jesus begins to give this, notice the verbs that he uses here. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not it will be given to me in the future. Not it might be given to me. It has been given to me. That means that he's reigning right now. And what he says next flows out of that. And we know the Great Commission is often used to describe why we care about missions, right? Why we care about sending people out, especially to the ends of the earth. Why we care about global missions. And that's absolutely right. And we're going to talk about that. But it's also more than that. See, when they are making disciples of the nations, when they're baptizing people outside the covenant community, they are bringing them into the covenant community. See, making, making disciples is not, like, it's not like making a knight, right? Like when you're making a knight, you know, you kneel down and 
they do the sword, I knight thee, whatever, you know, Sir William Stackler, right? And that's kind of done, other than Sir being in front of your name. It's not like they're just walking around going, hey, you're a disciple. You're a disciple. Discipleship is an active, ongoing process that occurs within the covenant community, within the life of the church. See, when we baptize our children, we are bringing them into that covenant community. Not in a way that saves them, but in a way that shows that they are visibly and integrally a part of that covenant community. It, uh, this passage is not just about reaching those outside the covenant community. It also tells us how we are to care for those within the covenant community. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, we are to be teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, what is all that he has commanded them? He's talking about the word here. We're to make disciples of the nations by bringing people into the covenant community, baptizing them and teaching the word. And we have to be committed to doing that. And we have to be committed to doing that with our covenant children. We have to teach the word. Because discipleship does not happen without the word. It just doesn't. What we do on Wednesday and Sunday nights is not self-help. It's not some model of self-actualization. It's not 10 steps to be the best you. What we want to do on Wednesday and Sunday nights is start and build the foundation of everything that we do on the Word of God. Because growth's not going to happen without that. Now another passage I want to look at that shows us how central the Word is to everything we do here, but specifically what we do with children and youth comes in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 22 through 2-3, Peter is going to tell the churches that he's writing to how important the Word is. Now I'm teaching 1 Peter in the fall, so for those youth that are in the room, I won't go too detailed to it. Listening to me once is probably enough, right guys? Twice would probably be too much, right? Okay. 1 Peter 22 through 2-3, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The word in this passage is described as spiritual milk. We are being compared here to infants. That we are to long for the word in the same way that an infant longs for milk. And we need it in the same way. Infants cannot grow without milk or formula. They just can't. It doesn't happen. In the same way, we and our children cannot grow without the word. But I also want you to look at verse 22 and 23 in chapter 1. Because I think this is incredibly important as we talk about caring for children and youth at Redeemer. See, Peter is telling the churches that he's writing to that they are to love each other. And the type of love that he describes really seems impossible. I mean, if you go through the entire book of 1 Peter and you look at the way that Peter is telling these churches he's writing to to love each other, it seems like nobody can do that because it's hard. It's strenuous, it's selfless, it's willing to endure suffering, it's even willing to endure unjust suffering. But in verse 23, he tells them how they're going to do that. He says, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Right? So we're born again of imperishable seed through what? What does it say right there? Through what?
the living and abiding Word of God. We are born again through the Word. Here at Redeemer, we believe what the writer of Hebrews says, that the Word is living and active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We believe that, and we believe that we need to put it in front of our children and youth every opportunity that we get. We also don't make the assumption that all of our covenant children are already saved. We can't make that assumption. So, we care about the maturation of the saints. We care about our children within the covenant community. We want them to know the word. And through the word to be born again, to come to faith in Jesus. And then we want to nurture and grow that faith. And, and make sure that you get the correct conjunction. It's and, it's not but. And... We also care about those outside our doors. We care about those outside the covenant community. Now why, we might ask, why? Simply put, because Jesus does. In the very same passage that we started with, in the Great Commission, Jesus is telling his disciples to go out and share the gospel message so that more people will come to faith in him. Go out, outside the doors, outside the covenant community, outside of even your comfort zone, share the gospel, find the lost, bring them into the covenant community. We see this again in John 10. Jesus talks here about pursuing those outside the covenant community. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Do You see what Jesus is doing here. He's comparing himself to a shepherd and his people to sheep. And look at what he says there in verse 16. Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is going to find those outside of the fold, outside of the flock, outside of the covenant community, and bring them into the fold. And then notice how he describes that new group. Those made up of people who were initially in the covenant community and those who were initially outside the covenant community. He said they're going to be one flock. There's not multiple flocks. One flock with one shepherd. Brothers and sisters, we should care about those who are not right now a part of our church, a part of our community, simply because Jesus does. We should be working to bring those who are outside of the covenant community into the life of the church. And that's why our children and youth ministries look like they do. We care about our covenant children. We want them to love Jesus. And we care about those outside the covenant community. And we want them to know Jesus too and love Jesus. And if we look at this text, we should not be surprised that there is opposition to that. There's opposition right here. Verse 20, they're talking about Jesus. They say, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Now they're protesting Jesus' claims to authority there too. But they're also protesting Jesus reaching outside the covenant community. But that doesn't stop Jesus. That didn't stop his disciples. That did not stop the early church. And there's no reason that that should stop us when there is opposition. So our children and youth ministries at Redeemer look different because Jesus cares about both groups, those within the covenant community and those outside of it. We're not made up prim primarily of one group of children here. We're not like many of the other PCA churches in the area that are almost exclusively made up of covenant children. 
But by the same token, we are not like many of the missions organizations here that are solely about reaching out. We have to do both here because we have both children inside our doors. And the question now comes, and this is where you get to the practical aspects. How do we do that? How do we do that? Zach, Laura, myself, we spend a lot of time talking about this and trying to figure this out, trying to come up with answers. I think the best answer that we can come up with here is simply it's hard. It's difficult. It's not easy. Because when you have this type of community, we all have to be giving things up for the sake of others. And that's hard to do. And we have to acknowledge that, that doing this type of ministry is very difficult. It's very hard. And it has always been hard. You look back through the Old Testament. We're going to jump into the book of Jonah for a second. You look there. It was hard. Jonah did not want to reach those outside the covenant community. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And bear with me. I'm going to read all the way through verse 16. So it's going to take just a minute. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, Tim Keller has a great sermon on this passage from way back in 1990. I listened to it again last week as I was preparing for this lesson, and I'm borrowing multiple points from him as I teach this. God tells Jonah to go out there, go outside the covenant community, to save a city full of people that do not know the Lord. They're also mentioned here as being evil. And many of you know this story. Jonah tries to flee. He gets on a ship headed in the opposite direction. He's trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. He doesn't want to reach those outside the covenant community. But God has other plans for him. God sends a storm. And all of the sailors on this ship, they think they're going to die. But did you catch what Jonah was doing? Sleeping. Jonah was sleeping down under the boat. And as this is happening, this pagan captain goes down below, 
wakes Jonah up and is angry, and rightfully so, with Jonah for not using his relationship with the Lord to help the good of those around him. At that moment, Jonah is actually oblivious to the problems of those around him. He's sleeping. He doesn't know that everybody around him in his current situation feels like they are about to die. But when Jonah gives himself up, now we know the whole story, but seemingly right there, it seems like he gives himself up to die. This changes these men on the ship. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. These men are seemingly saved when they see what Jonah was willing to give up for them, those outside of the covenant community. See, when we pursue a multi-ethnic community, and on top of that, when we try to reach those within our doors and those outside our doors... We have to be willing to give things up. And we have to start with humility. Because you find out later in the book of Jonah that Jonah's main issue was self-righteousness. Right? He didn't really think the people of Nineveh deserved grace. Somehow he thought he did. But we have to realize that we all need grace. We all have to realize that like that passage in John 10... We are all the sheep who were at one time outside of that fold. And it's purely by God's grace that we are now within the fold. We have to be compassionate for all those within our covenant community and those outside our covenant community. Look, if your children come to our children and youth programs at Redeemer, I can promise you, regardless of who you are, what race, ethnicity, or cultural background, they are going to be around children who are not like them. Because we have kids in our youth programs that go to public school from all different races and cultural backgrounds. We have people that go to private school from different races and cultural backgrounds. We have people that are homeschooled who come from different races and different cultural backgrounds. There is not one little group that you can pigeonhole within our children and youth ministry at Redeemer. And that means that we cannot value one group over another. We can't value one culture over another. We have to work hard to make sure that we create an environment that does not make people feel like they are somehow the other. Because that can shut down the ability to build relationships and to share the gospel. And this can be particularly hard for majority culture to understand. And at Redeemer, that, that is still typically white middle class culture. That is still the majority culture here. I had the privilege, my first four years out of college, I coached basketball at Jackson State. Um, That was back in 2008, 2008 to 2012. And my first day on campus was the big kind of, you know how colleges, schools have these big staff, faculty, convocations, everybody goes together, there's a main speaker, they give kind of a rah-rah speech, let's get ready for the semester. So we go to the Rosie McCoy, the big auditorium there, and Uh, We listen to all these speeches, and then the entire athletic department goes back to the AAC, which is the basketball facility that also houses the athletic offices and the Hall of Fame room where we were meeting. So we're meeting in the Hall of Fame room, and the president of the university, at that time it was still Ronald Mason, comes to address all of the athletic department staff. There are about 60 of us in there, okay? And I'm the only white guy in the group, all right? This is my first day. And Dr. Mason starts talking, all right? And Dr. Mason's a big pacer, constantly back and forth, constantly back and forth as he's talking. But about two or three minutes into his talk, he stops and looks out and looks right at me. (laughs) And he points at me. And he says in a very accusatory manner, who are you? And at that moment, all right, I know I could still pass for 16 or 17, and my facial hair still comes in that way. 
But that was 10 years ago, and I was 22, okay? And I was right out of college, first day on campus. I'm the only white guy in the room. I don't know anybody other than the guy who hired me in the room. And I had no idea what to say. Like, I literally think if I had said something, my most honest answer would have been, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, the way you're saying it, I don't, know, I don't know who I am. Tell me. Tell me, who am I? Now, now, thankfully, my boss was sitting right next to me. He stands up, explains who I am. Apparently, it was a satisfactory answer. And so I didn't have to say a word, thankfully, because I don't know what I would have said. But I tell that story as an example, because for me, at 22 years old, that was the first time in my life that I was recognized as the other because of the color of my skin. First time in my life at 22 years old that I was the different one. I grew up in majority culture. I grew up where almost everybody around me looked like me. That was the first time in my life, but you'll, you'll, if you talk to people who are not a part of the majority culture, you'll find out that their stories are often radically different than that. It definitely doesn't take 22 years to have that kind of experience. And we have to make sure that our children and youth programs at Redeemer, in addition to our church as a whole, make people feel like they're welcome. Don't feel like their difference or otherness makes them less worthy of our time, our resources, and certainly not the gospel. Because that's at the heart of all of it, is that we all need Jesus, those within the covenant community and those outside. Dr. M Micah Edmondson, as a pastor of New City Fellowship. It's an OPC church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In the summer of 2016, he gave a talk to the Gospel Coalition Council. Uh, the Gospel Coalition Council is kind of the leadership group of the Gospel Coalition. They were meeting at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School uh, just outside of Chicago. And his address was largely based on ethnocentrism and racism in the church. And Dr. Edmondson makes the point that often where the church fails is simply following Romans 12, 15. To rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And he says, where we really tend to fail is that second part, that weeping with those who weep part. Listen to what Dr. Edmondson says. He says, the unique calling of the church as opposed to the institutions of the world is not simply to tolerate one another, or even simply to understand one another, but to mourn with one another and bear one another's burdens. To deliberately devote ourselves to listen to one another for understanding, and then to empathize with one another to the point of shedding tears with one another. That's certainly not what so many of the talking heads on cable TV and talk radio are advocating. They're not talking about mourning with those who mourn. But in the church, white suburban men are called to cry tears with a black inner city woman scared to death her husband is going to be the next Eric Garner, or that her teenage son is going to be the next Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice. And if you are so entrenched in your socio-political camp that you can't shed some tears with others, something is deeply wrong, because that's who the church is called to be. That's the kind of thing that makes our unity in Christ really conspicuous and causes people to see that there is a unique power at work in the church unlike anything in this world. Now, brothers and sisters, that, that quote is not in any way a political statement. There was nothing political in there. What it was was simply a challenge to the church that at the very least we are called to follow Scripture and to weep with those who weep, regardless of if we agree with what they're weeping about. What is happening out there in the world, it matters. And we can't be asleep in the bottom of the boat like Jonah. Now why do I say this? I say this because it matters to the children involved in our children and youth ministries. We have covenant children that come through our doors. And life in this world and things that are happening in this world are pressing into them and are hurting them, confusing them, scaring them. And we also have those from outside the covenant community 
coming through our doors and they're hurting, confused, scared. Middle school and high school can be an incredibly difficult, confusing, scary time for many people. At the very least, when kids walk through our doors, they need to find people who will listen to them. When need be, weep and cry tears with them and point them to hope in Jesus. We have a tremendous opportunity here at Redeemer to love and care for our church community and our community around us and our city And I believe that that really begins with our children and youth, with our little ones. And we need your help. We need our church members. We need our parents to continue to serve in our ministries. It's important for our children and youth to see parents engaged in these ministries. We need each other. Elizabeth and I need you. We need help with our daughters, especially our four-year-old Caroline. I had to spank her last week, and I spanked her over her underwear, and she got angry at me and told me that I did it wrong, and I was supposed to pull the underwear down first so it would hurt more. (laughs) She got legitimately angry with me. Elizabeth and I need your help. We all need each other's help. I'll finish here. Daniel 9 is just under a thousand words, 998 to be exact, in the ESV. So I'm not going to read it. I'm going to spare you that right now. But I I would encourage you to go back and read Daniel chapter 9 if you have not or if you have not recently. I would encourage you to do it with as many commentaries as you can find, okay? Because the second half of Daniel, chapter 7 through 12, it's, it's all apocalyptic literature, okay? So it's similar to Revelation. It's highly symbolic and often very difficult to understand, okay? Now, particularly verses 24 through 27 here are tough to understand. And so some resource would be helpful for you to figure out what's actually going on there. But most of Daniel 9 is a prayer. Daniel's been studying the book of Jeremiah. And Daniel sees there that the exile, that the people of Israel are currently in exile in Babylon. And he sees there that the exile was supposed to last for 70 years. And so Daniel begins praying for that. He begins praying for the end of the exile. But the really neat thing about Daniel chapter 9 is in this very same chapter, we get to see an answer to prayer. It's really, really cool. He prays. And as he is praying, the angel Gabriel comes and gives him God's answer to his prayer. If you're familiar with Daniel, or if you read it later, the answer to prayer is found in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. It's this vision of 70 weeks. I'm not going to get into the specifics here of of what exactly this is this vision of 70 weeks means, okay? There's a lot of debate on what it means, but I will tell you that a lot of commentators believe that what Daniel is being given is a broad overview of the future in verses 24 through 27. And and there are a number of commentators within that subset that believe that Daniel's actually being given a vision of the death of Jesus, Now, we believe that Daniel was written in the 6th century B.C. If that's the case, do you see what is happening there? Daniel's praying in the 6th century B.C. And he receives an answer to his prayer. But what he's really being pointed to is going to happen more than 500 years after he dies. The answer to his prayer is pushing Daniel to look beyond his immediate circumstances, beyond the immediate difficulty that they're feeling, and look towards the ultimate end of the exile that's going to happen when Jesus comes to this earth. Now, why, why do I say that? Why do I bring up this passage? What does it mean for us? It may be easier first to say what it does not mean. 
It's not an excuse for us to not engage our surrounding culture. It's not an excuse to remove ourselves from suffering and not work to end suffering wherever we see it. It doesn't mean that, and we shouldn't use passages like this as a crutch that leads us to passivity. But it does mean that we are to be patient. It does mean that we have to be incredibly gracious with each other because we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to hurt each other. Most importantly, this response to Daniel's prayer, it shows us that every prayer that anyone has has ultimately been answered in Jesus. Because he's coming back one day. He's going to make all things new. He's going to make all the wrongs right. And it's in light of that very fact that we engage in all of the ministries here at Redeemer. Do I have any questions before we pray? We have a couple minutes before that bell's going to ring. Micah Edmondson. Yeah, if you search Micah Edmondson Gospel Coalition, you can probably find it pretty quickly. I would encourage anybody that wants to listen to that to actually listen to it, though. You can read the text, but it's much better when you actually hear his delivery. Yes. Hold on just a second, Pierce. I'll, I'll answer Otis's question first, and then I got you. All right? Uh, so the first thing I would say is just coming in contact with people who are different than them. Uh, that's incredibly hard, and especially with those who don't have fully developed frontal lobes, um, especially in middle school, that can be really difficult um, to come in contact with those who are not like you. And that's very difficult. Uh, the, the question was, what, what do we see as some of the issues currently for our children and youth at Redeemer in our programs? Uh, I think that's the first thing. It's just that it's hard coming in contact with those uh, who you don't know. I think it's also hard, and we're going to talk about this. If you look on your uh, bulletin this morning, on August 26th, it says we're going to have a, a children and youth symposium. What we're going to do this year is we're going to combine our children and youth orientation and leader training with a parent symposium. We're going to invite parents into that to talk a little bit more deeply about some of the issues we face. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is even just how to talk through anxiety with your kids. Uh, that as kids come to children and youth programs and say, I don't like it or say, I hate it. I don't ever want to go back. How to talk them through that. And how to actually even sometimes recognize that that may be a manifest, manifestation of anxiety and how we are to walk through that anxiety. So I see anxiety with kids who don't want to come sometimes. Uh, and I think that's normal. I mean, think about walking into the lunchroom in middle school, right? When you walk into the lunchroom in middle school, especially if, you're, if you go to this church and, and you don't go to school with other kids who are here, which that is a lot of our children in youth ministry. We don't have people who have a bunch of friends that go to school with them. And so there's not get there, see, okay, there's my safe group. Now, some people do have that. But there are also kids who don't. So I think really learning how to talk, talk with your kids about anxiety is important. The other things I would just add is if your children are expressing difficulty and if they're expressing hardship, if they're expressing not want to come, I would really encourage you, talk to me, talk to Zach, talk to Laura. We'd love to hear that. We, we would love to engage with you and sit down and have a meal with you and talk through that. That, that to me is much more helpful and better then, you know, two months later saying, hey, I hadn't seen you for a while. And saying, oh, well, you know, he didn't really like it or she didn't really like it, so they're not going to come. I would encourage you to, to reach out to us. We, we want to engage with you. We want to hear those things. And, and our goal is to help you as you disciple your children. What you got, Pierce? Thank you, Pierce. I appreciate that. Anybody else? <laughs> 17. I'm 32 now. 
All right, well, then I'm going to pray for us so we can get to our kids in time. Heavenly Father, uh, we are grateful for your church. We are grateful for your people, for all of those within this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to care and love those children and youth in our covenant community. We are also for, grateful for the opportunities that you give us to care for those who are outside the covenant community. We pray that you would uh, give us hearts to do that, give us humility, give us grace, uh, enable us to just love each other well. Uh, we can't do that on our own. Uh, we need your Holy Spirit. We need the Word in order to do that, Father. I thank you for all of the ways that you bless us, for all the ways you protect your church, and pray that you would continue to do that. We do. Thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.